Well, we're in the Fresnel week as we start part two of Fresnel diffraction. And this topic is a very interesting topic in physics where it kind of draws from a lot of different things. You have the wavefront, you have the Huygens Fresnel wavelet uh, model going on, and then you have approximations that you make. There's a richness here. And you then come up with integrals that you can't do. So historically, these have been figured out numerically before the days of calculators and computers. And they are summarized very neatly, the Fresnel integrals, in a marvelous diagram called the Euler spiral or the Cornu spiral. And we're going to look at that in somewhat detail. So I hope you enjoy this class, second class on Fresnel diffraction. Chapter V. Fresnel diffraction. Part two. Let's go back and look at our zones. Draw a couple of them for L zones. And here, say point O out here, something came up like this for one of the zones, and over there, the P. But what's interesting about this is that this is like a lens, like something is coming from a point and then going to another point. So if you think of a lens, light comes from a point to say a converging lens and it can converge then to another point from O to P and you know, this is your object distance this is your image distance of the point. And then one over F is one over S O plus one over S I. And up here, for example, if this is your Z prime to get you to go to the, to the center there. And then over on this side, say this is a Z then you have one over F would be one over Z prime plus one over Z, making the analogy. And what's really neat about this is that when you're dealing with glass lenses, you're getting a focus by the principle of refraction. Here you're getting a focus by the principle of diffraction. Now from last class, we had for the optical path difference involving the mth Fresnel zone, we had the radius of the Fresnel zone, the mth one, square it, over two, and we had one over Z prime plus one over Z. And we set that equal to M lambda over two from last class. So now we can see that the focal length here, that shows up in here, one over the focal length, we're gonna make a definition. It makes sense to call this, well, F, or we'll also call it, say, L. And that's going to be equal to, we find here, combination we'd have uh, here, uh, Z plus Z prime. Uh, Z cancels Z, you have one over Z prime, and then Z prime cancels Z prime. So these equations kind of relate to a focal length. We're basically saying here that rm squared over 2, and this is 1 over L, this part, 
So then looking at this equation, we can then solve uh, for the L. And you would find here that twos cancel. M lambda divide by the R squared is one over L. And then the L, which is also the focal length, you flip it. So this would be R M squared over M lambda. Notice this is interesting equation. We know L is fixed given the Z prime and a Z which means this must be fixed. And that means we can pick any M. These are gonna always be, you know, work out to be the same since it's a constant. So let's go ahead and pick the M equal to one. And then the focal length will be the first radius squared over the wavelength. Cool formula. This shows some serious dispersion. In other words, the focal length depends very heavily on that wavelength. The concept of, in fact, we probably should go ahead and call this section something. So let's call this uh, V1, the Fresnel zone plate. So now we imagine having a plate that can block out some of these concentric ring areas, or these ribbons. Here is an example where this is passing the first Fresnel zone, blocking the second one, letting the third one in, blocking four, so it's letting in the odd zones. And let's look at some engineering problems with this Vernell zone plate idea. So let's look at example one and let's say we have a plate with 10 concentric rings and say we're passing the odd ones like the picture we just looked at. So odds pass evens are blocked. And say we design it for 500 nanometers for the wavelength. And let's say we're shooting for a focal length here for the design 50 centimeters. Like that's the uh, design parameters to work with these parameters. So if that's the case, when you actually start making the plate, we need to make some measurements um, and we want the radius. Like if we look at this formula, the radius of the first, the radius of the first zone. All right, so we can, when we design the plate, we can uh, make sure that is gonna get transmitted. That's gonna be uh, here, if you have R1 squared, there's lambda times F. R1 is the square root of lambda F. So if we put in here for the lambda, let's say we put in the 500 times 10 to the minus ninth meters and the focal length, say five times 10 to the minus 1.5 meters is 50 centimeters. So if we look at this, we would have five times 500 is 2,500. And then we'd have 10 to the minus 10, the nine and the one combining. And this would be square root of 2,500 is 50. And the square root of 10 to the minus 10 is 10 to the minus five. So if we move the decimal point over twice, we would have 0 0.50 times 10 to the minus three. And that would give us a half 
of a millimeter. Nice. Nice little application. Now, if you knock out those even zones, you're going to get reinforcement because those odd ones reinforce. Because if you skip one, remember the way they're set up, you have lambda over two, but if you skip one, then you have back the lambda and that's in phase, in phase, in phase. So a quick estimate of what we're gonna get if we have those 10 reinforcing, that would be giving you approximately, when you square, you know, 100 times stronger. And we're ignoring the obliquity factor here and we're making a rough estimate. Nice, look at that. Technically, this is gonna be measured by a scientific instrument. 100, we say 100 times stronger, the irradiance. And if we use the word brightness, you gotta be careful because the human eye is nonlinear and something that has twice as much energy does not necessarily appear twice as bright. I mean, it's brighter if you increase the intensity and the irradiance, but it doesn't, have a simple relationship. So whenever we say brighter or irradiance, we're talking about a scientific meter, you know, measuring it. Well, let's look at example two, little problem with numbers and engineering. Suppose we have a zone plate where the first radius, first zone is one centimeter. And in this design, we want uh, to work with 500 nanometers for the wavelength. Question here would be like, like what's the focal length? So we pull out the formula here that we used uh, earlier, this formula up here. So that would be F is R1 squared over lambda. Now one centimeter would be 0 0.01 meter and we're going to square that. And then down here we have 500 nanometer, which would be 10 to the minus 9. So this is going to be 1 fifth. This is 10 to the minus 2. It's going to be squared, so that'll be 10 to the minus 4. And here, if we move that decimal point over 2, we'll have a 10 to the minus 7. So this is 1 fifth. You got the minus four minus a minus seven will get you a 10 to the third power. So the focal length would be 1000 over five, which would be 200 meters. Wow. That's, that's uh, like what the football a field like two of them or something, you know, 200 meters. I mean, that's that's a that's very very weak type of a lens. In fact, uh, the one over f, which is your diopters, would be one over 200, a 200th of a diopter. So that's like a point, you know, a twentieth is a point zero five. So there's like another zero in there. So. 0 0.005 diopters. Wow. V2 the Fresnel approximation. Now I'm going to be squaring a lot of terms and I find it a little bit awkward to square when there's a prime. It's a little bit notation-wise, a little awkward. So let's let's redefine something so that we don't have any primes. And when we write down a square, it'll be easier. So we'll have a subscript instead. So the R prime, this thing, let's call that a row, the row family of those lines. Uh, you could say row one, row two, but in general, just say there's a, if you pick one out, just say row. And then here, this Z prime would be then rho sub zero. Then over on the other side, the Z, we'll call that R sub zero. And then these R's, the family, we can leave that the way they are. There's R, some arbitrary one is an R. 
So if we have that set up, then if we look at this diagram that has an opening where we're going to let pass you know, some light, then this is your rho naught, this is your r naught, this is rho to that point. It's an arbitrary point, little, a little differential area. And then this is your r. And so coordinate system the x and the y and say the z. So it kind of preserves that z that we had above. And we're going to now pick up from last class. And from last class, what we had is this formula e at point p. We had e naught over z, z prime. So this is just copying from last class over the aperture e to the i k r prime plus r. Nice formula, dA. So with our new notation here, the EP will be then E naught over, this is going to be the Z, the Z was up here, and that's going to become R naught. So that's R naught, and the Z prime, which is up here, is a rho naught. So that's the rho naught like that. And then for this integral, the r prime is the rho, and the r stays the same. So there we have it. So the approximation we're going to make is that the x and the y that gets you to this little place here, like if you go, say, an x, and then you go up to y, that these dimensions, like these lengths are small compared to these big ones, like the rho, rho naught, r, and r naught. So if that's the case, we're going to now write down some equations. We're going to write down, for example, the rho is going to be the square root of, we're going to look at this, uh, the triangle here. This little piece here is going to be x squared plus y squared. And then this piece, this piece will be rho naught squared. So rho naught squared plus x squared plus y squared gets you rho, the square root. Of that, so you're squaring the row naught, and you're squaring this leg of the triangle. Uh, this is like a right angle, and you want x squared plus y squared. So when we do that, we can pull out the row naught, which is the big one, and have then one plus x squared over row naught squared plus y squared over row naught squared to the one half power. And since the x and y are small compared to this, we're going to be able to uh, replace this part here with 1 plus, you know, 1 half, remember our expansion idea, x squared over rho naught squared plus y squared over 2 rho naught squared, like that. And then... You can put the row back in, and if you put the row back in, you'll find that row is row naught plus, you'll have here x squared over two row naught plus y squared over two row naught. And if we do the exact same thing with the r, to find the r on this side, you get the same equation where you replace the row with r's. So let's look at that over here. We have the two equations. The row is row naught plus x squared over two row naught plus y squared over two row naught. 
and the exact same question, the exact same equation with the r would be an r naught plus x squared over two r naught plus a y squared over two r naught. That's for the other side because you have, you know, here's your row naught, here's your r naught, and then you did something like this. You know where you had your row up here and your r and then this side here if you square that that's where you get the x squared plus y squared make the approximation we're all set now just remember that this is where we're going ep is e naught over row naught r naught i like to write the row one first since it's on the left and then we're integrating it e to the i k rho plus r dA. So this is all of our equations, like we're all set here. And this is a Fresnel approximation to, to do this. And now we want to add, we want to add these together to put them up in there. All right. So you add these together, the rho plus the r, you're going to get a rho naught plus an r naught. And then plus, now let's see, we're going to have the x squared plus y squared over the rho naught, x squared plus y squared over the r naught. So we can take out the x squared plus the y squared over 2. And that's going to be 1 over rho naught plus 1 over r naught. So since you have x squared over 2 and y squared over 2 and you have a 1 over r naught, that's this one x squared over 2 plus y squared over 2, and that's over the rho naught. So, like, that's it. And then if we want to add these together the usual way, like this, we would get rho naught plus r naught, the sum over the product. Okay, so now all this stuff has to be put up in there. So, this is a lot to write out here. EP going to be equal to e naught rho naught r naught integration over the area e to the i k now we're going to put all this stuff has to go go in here so let's just do it like that you know for now and we can see that this part's constant, so I can pull that out. And if I pull that out, in other words, I can pull out the E to the I, K, the rho naught and the R naught, naught part, because see, this is going to be, you know, there's an exponential here, and an exponential here, you know, there's an I, K, an I, K, and so this is going to be there, and all that's going to be up in there. So I can pull that out, absorb that into the constant, and don't worry about that constant. We're going to absorb stuff in the constants a lot, and then we'll, we'll uh, normalize things and show you what that constant means at the end. So here we would have then e to the i k, we would have this second part. So that would be x squared plus y squared over 2, and then here, rho naught plus r naught over rho naught times r naught. There. That looks a little bit more manageable by absorbing constants in the constant. So now here, what we're going to do is write out specifically the integrations over uh, here, this little dA is your dx dy. That that's that cute little patch. The cute cute little patch up in here is a little dx. That's the x direction, and a little dy. So that means we're going to go from some x one to some x two, and from some y one to some y two e to the i k and here 
I'm just going to write down everything again here. Rho naught plus R naught over Rho naught R naught and dx dy. Okay, now here, what we're going to do is the convention, and this is a beautiful convention as you'll see this unfold, is that the x squared term here, take the x squared over 2 and say multiply here by k, like this, and then take the r naught and rho naught. We take this, we're basically pointing out the x squared part here. So this is going to multiply the i. But see, this is suggesting to like define another variable to, to clean things up. Remember your k is 2 pi over lambda. It's our definition of k. You get x squared here over 2. And then you have uh, this uh, factor here. I'm going to rearrange things slightly. This is the convention that has been chosen. And you'll see it's a beautiful convention uh, as we uh, proceed. We're going to leave the pi over 2 and put the 2, we're going to put the 2 in with these constants. So that 2 goes here, pi is there, lambda, we need to get lambda somewhere, so let's put lambda there, and then that two is here, the other two is down there, and then you got all this stuff there. So everything looks good. So it's suggesting that we define a new variable so that this is all u squared. All right, and don't worry about the pi and the two. You'll see how that comes out nicely later. And this is convention, so it could have been done differently historically, but this is the, the definition of this u variable. And the v would go with the y squared. The y squared one would be similar to get the v squared. Now, when you do this, you're basically saying that when that happens, this exponential is going to look real cute. It'll be i pi over 2, and you'll have u squared plus v squared because there's the pi over two, and there's the u squared, and the i is still hanging around. And that's gonna factor real nice into these two dimensions like this. Now, when you look at the dx dy, you gotta replace that with a d u d v okay d u d v but here if you were to look at the definition of x the x definite or the u definition rather the u definition is when you take the square root you have x and then you have all this stuff for the square root sign And then you'll have the v1 with the similar, actually the same, square root thing in there. Okay, the point is that when you replace the dx dy, you're going to have a du dv over a bunch of constant stuff. So when we do that, we're going to absorb all those constants in a cavalier fashion with the other constant. So we'll have constant C. Just throw all that constant stuff in. And then you'll have, you'll go from U1 to U2, E to the I pi, U squared over two. And we'll go ahead and separate these. 
the du, then we'll have a v integration, v1 to v2, e i pi v squared over 2 dv. Now, now that looks really nice. And this is, this is the beautiful equation. You know, if you want to put a prime there, say, all right, technically that, that constant's different, you can. It's some new constant. So now, this is the setup, and this brings us to the Fresnel integrals. So V3, the Fresnel integrals. Uh, these integrals, even though they look simple, they cannot be done in a simple way. So if you look at one of these, e to the i pi u squared over 2, that integral can be written using the Euler relation as two integrals. There's a cosine pi u squared over 2, and then there's going to be here an i times the sine of pi u squared over 2 using Euler du. So this naturally appears like in two places, the same kind of a form, you know, formulation of stuff. So the cosine integral, when you integrate this one, the cosine, and this will be it, I'm going to write this down as integrating from zero to u as sort of a standard, standard uh, formula. And then we'll have the S to represent the sine. So like the big C stands for cosine, and this is like the sine one. Integrate from U, zero to U, some like generic integration. Sine pi U squared over two DU. Now you might, say I shouldn't do this, that I should put like a prime here since I'm integrating, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like you're integrating over the same thing, using the same thing twice. But you know, physicists like to do this. Look at this work formula. Work is force times distance, all right, dx. But force is mass times acceleration. But acceleration is dv dt, dx. Now, if I let these be finite deltas, I can then start shifting deltas around and then put them back at the end. Mathematicians don't like you to move these around unless they're, unless they're finite deltas, like delta v. But to be a little cavalier, and I'll have the delta x, delta t, and the dv like, like this. But if you do it with deltas, you can do it and then put it back differentials. So this is equal to m v d v, and then often what physicists will do is they'll integrate from zero to v and have the same v there, and this gets you then v squared over two, and you get the famous derivation of the kinetic energy formula for the work energy theorem. So so don't worry about using the same the same variable. I mean, if you want, you could put a prime there and a prime there, but then it's going to mess up my square with the prime. So this is fine. This is done a lot in, in physics. So no, no big deal. So what, what do these integrals look like? Well, here you have a plot of the integrals, the cosine one and the, and the sine one. So these are integrals and you're integrating from zero to you is what you're doing. And these are the results. Isn't that cool? Very nice, very nice stuff. Now we'd like to try to understand this a little bit, what's going on. So let's look at one of these integrals, the cosine of pi u squared over two du from zero to u. Suppose, that the u is small. So if the u is very small, then the cosine of a small value, a rating value, is going to be like one. 
So that means this thing is like integrating for the small case from zero to u, you're integrating one du. Well, that's going to be u from zero to u, and the answer is going to be u. That's it. But see, that means that this big C of u, the cosine integration, is approximately u. Straight line. Hey, look. Straight line. In fact, if you look at this, this is 1. Up here is 1. And this is straight line. This is like the function here is this cu function is equal to u. It's like saying y is equal to x. It's like a straight line. You go from 0 to 0 to 1, 1. Isn't that cool? And look, that's pretty far out there. That thing worked out pretty good, man. Look at that. So that helps us understand things a little bit better. And then if we were to look at, say, the SU one for small u, this is the sine case where you have the sine of pi u squared over 2. And this would be, you know, approximately the sine of a small angle theta is like theta. So that means this would integrate out. You would have the integral from 0 to u. You would have then, you just put the, this is like theta. Just put the theta down again like this. And we can do that integral easily. That's going to be a cubed. So that's going to be pi over 2, u cubed over 3. And we evaluate from 0 to u. It's just going to be that. Like we're done. We're finished. That's it. So since pi is close to 3, this is like saying u cubed over 2. Now, u should be small. But I'm going to be bold. And I want to pick u to be 1. If u is 1, then s of 1 should be 0.5. Now, it really shouldn't be working for this, but look, if I go here where I pick u to be 1, all right, then you find that here, this is u down in here, so there is u as 1. And if I come up here, look at that. That's the red one. It's almost 0.5, like, 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 whoa. So this is u cubed, this is this is the cubic function. See, this is u cubed. See, isn't that wild? And it, like it's it's almost reaching the point five, point five at one. So, like we understand, see, uh, this these graphs, these Fresnel integrals, quite well by studying in detail the uh, small u realm. So, note that uh, our results here. If we look at this one here, I just want to, because we're going to plot this in a second somewhere else, that if you look at what happens when you put in zero, like you don't integrate at all, then the integrals come out to be zero. Like you didn't integrate at all. In other words, you went from zero to zero. And so they're both down here. That makes sense. And then let's uh, go ahead and put in our result where we had one, when we had one, our result was that we would get, well, we would get one, but at this point, let's, let's put in what the value for one really is. It's really close to 0.8, so, because this is pushing it too far. So this is basically a 0.8, and then this, well, we'll leave this as 0.5, because that's pretty close to 0.5. There we go. So we have two, we have two uh, summaries here of our work. Because now the fun begins with, or continues, with the Cornu spiral, also called the Euler sp spiral, where you plot, now what you do is you plot the CU, and that's an integral already done, uh, this, let's go ahead and remind us, ourselves, that that's an integral. That's the cosine 
So pi u squared over two du. And the sine integral, these are the capital letters that represent the integrals. So zero to u of the sine. Now we're doing pure math now in a sense because we're gonna need these in the Fresnel diffraction equation that these show up. So we wanna just like, we're taking a pause here to like study the math because you can't do the integrals. So here, if we're gonna plot, we're to do a plot in the complex plane because remember that the integral that we're interested in is gonna be the cosine one plus i times the sine one when you do the Fresnel stuff, when you do the physics. And now we're gonna look at the, we're gonna look at the result. This is what you get when you plot the cosine integral along the real axis and the sine integral along the imaginary axis. Now this is an amazing thing I'm gonna show you that if you were to like do an arc length, you know, here, you know where the arc length like a ds squared in the calculus is a dx squared plus a dy squared. Uh, here you have a dc squared plus a ds squared because that's what you're plotting, c and s, and there's the c and there's the s. But a dc, that's undoing that integral. That's gonna be cosine pi u squared over two du. And the ds, we're just going backwards. If you integrate this thing, you get then the c and then you get the integral. But we're taking a differential. This is sine, let me go ahead and do that, pi u squared over two du. But now let's check this out. If you square these things, and add them up because that's what these you know these things are here. This is the d, uh, the ds, the height. This is the dc because this is like your x coordinate. This is your y coordinate. But if you square them and add them up, what's cosine squared plus sine squared? There's one. So in other words, the dc squared plus the ds squared is going to be one times the du squared. That means this u parameter is being realized as the arc length. That is wild. That is amazing. In other words, the arc length of the graph is du. Right. So the u variable can be represented here. See, there's zero, there's a u getting bigger, u going negative. I would like to make now eight observations on the Cornu spiral. And I have these in the, in the notes here for you all written out. The first one is to check if our result from before, if we put in, you know, zero, don't integrate at all, that you're supposed to get zero, zero, like you didn't integrate at all. Well, yeah, there it is. Like, that's the point there. So if C is zero and S is zero, like that's the point, it's right there. Now, what about our other case? We said that at a C of one and S is one, so this is a second observation here, was roughly a 0.8 and a 0.5. So let's look for that point. We want the C to be a 0.8. So you come over there, there's the C and you can go up and there's the 0.5. See, it's like, it's like it's up here. And look, the U is one. And this is observation three. If you take this thing and wrap it down like this, this thing would probably come out to about there and guess what's out there? 0.8, 1.0. So isn't that amazing? Look at that, you just take that thing and unwind it. 
So this is a measure of the U. Observation four. We found that for small u, c of u was approximately u. And we found that the s of u was u cubed over 2. So let's look for small u. Small u would be in around in here because this is your u. Well, if you have small u, then the c is the, is the u. It's like, it is the u. Well, that's what that line means, see? Because if you go along u, that's what the c is. So that one checks out. Then if you look at the s one, when it's really small, you know, this is like going to be zero, but then it, what happens, it starts to pick up, see? So this one starts to go up like this. And notice that the u is still behaving itself, is still the c. So the c is 0.5. And look, the U is 0.5 there, but now you have the UQ kicking in. You have this thing climbing up. So very, very nice observation. Notice that if we go back to here, we see that these results start to oscillate at lower and lower amplitudes, and they're wiggling around, the Cs and the, you know, the Ss. And that's what's going to happen uh, to the spiral. As things get smaller and smaller, they're wiggling around some more, you get this spiral effect going on. And then notice that when you look at CU, that's the cosine, cosine's even, sine is odd. So that means uh, you would have, when you have in other words, when you go to, say, you integrate C, you're going to go from, say, 0 to minus U. You want to go in the other direction. Cosine is going to be the same. Sine is going to go negative. So if cosine is going to be the same, that means we'll have this reflected on this side. But since the sine is negative, it's going to push it down there. So you get that kind of inversion effect because of the nature of the sine and cosines are, you know, this cosine's even and the sine is odd. So it's like, you can understand like the, the like symmetry uh, going on there. Observation seven, if you look at uh, the equations we already have written down, we already did all this, that the slope, like this is like doing a dy dx kind of thing, Remember, S is on the y-axis and C is on the x. The slope is the tangent. Wild, all right? So when is the slope zero? Well, the slope's going to be zero when your tangent, you want your tangent's going to be zero. Uh, think of it like your tangent is your sine of theta over cosine theta. If you want the tangent to be zero, you want the sine to be zero. So where is the sine zero? Well, the sine is going to be zero at zero, at pi, zero, the sine is zero at pi, at two pi, three pi, four pi. So if that's the case, then the u squared, you're going to divide by the pi, and then you need to double. So uh, if you divide by the pi, you get a one, then you double, you get two. So like these are the numbers, zero, two, and then four, divide by the pi, here you get a two, but then you got to uh, double it. That's the u squared, then you take the square root, and uh, notice that here the slope is zero, where u is zero, and notice that if you go to the square root of two is 1.4, it's like up here, slope is zero. And then if you go to uh, plus or minus two, that's down there. See the way the U wraps that. If you unwrap the U, the, the, the U, you would have the uh, the axis uh, labels there matching. See, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So uh, that's two then. The slope is zero. That's good. Amazing. Then uh, let's try looking for when the slope is infinite. Well, that's when the cosine, since you have the sine over the cosine, if you want infinite tangent, just think of the cosine's got to go crazy, got to go zero. 
So when's the cosine zero? Well, that's going to be when theta is like, that's going to be like pi over two, three halves pi, five halves pi. Then when you want to find a u square, you're going to kill the uh, twos, all the twos go away, pi's go away. So when the twos and pi's go away, this becomes one, three, five, one, three, five. And then if you take the square root, plus or minus, you get one, plus or minus one, plus or minus square root of three, plus or minus square root of five. So plus or minus, here's the one, slope's infinite. Minus one down there, slope's infinite. Plus or minus square root of three, that's like 1.7 or something. So yeah, it's between 1.5 and two. Slope's infinite, slope's infinite. And then plus or minus square root of five is what, like, like two point something. So yeah, two point something right up in there. There it is. Amazing. Another observation is, you know, when you do your uh, integral of f of x dx, in the math books, they have this cool way of setting up integral calculus where you look at, say, a delta x here, and this is your function. And what they do is they say, take the f of x times the delta x, and that's the area of a strip. And then you're going to sum them all up. So if you look at our integral, e to the i pi over 2 u squared du, same idea. Like this is like some sum to get all, to get all the area. So this is some sum of little phasers. So you have some delta u like that. So if we look at our, our graph here, these are little cute phasers. See, there's one there. And then as that, you know, that's zero. So zero cosine is going to be there is no, there's no y one. And then here, so you pick up a little bit like that. So these are little arrows. So when you're doing the integral, it's like following all these arrows. And if you go to infinity, you wind up there, a 0.5 and a 0.5 for the uh, C and the S. Very nice. So a lot of insight there. Uh, V5 is using Cornu spiral. How do we use the thing? Well, in diffraction, we're going to get problems like this, u1 to u2. Like you're, inter you're integrating, remember, over some little patch there, maybe some area that you're interested in, or a slit. So you have i pi u squared over 2 du. So we will break this up in going from uh, u1 to 0 of e to the i pi u squared over 2. And then we'll go from zero to u two of the integration. Now we're going to take this one and flip this one the other way to go from zero to u one and put a minus sign in front. So then this integral of interest in physics would be the integral from zero to u two, like the top one e to the i pi over 2 u squared minus 0 to u1, that's the lower one, i pi u squared over 2 du. But guess what? This is obtained from the Cornu spiral. This is the cosine integral u2 plus i sine u2 from the from the tables or the corner spiral and then minus over here this is the value u1 all right u1 uh the i is there uh, with the s's so we're gonna we can here look at this as saying wait a minute wait a minute this is like taking a cu and an i su and just evaluating it u1 and u2 like using the standard calculus notation in other words, this integral from u1 to u2 of e to the i pi u squared over 2 du has been reduced to the integral being done for us by reference to the Cornu spiral.
So you just consult the Cornu spiral and find what the values are at U1 and U2 and do this, you know, subtraction. It's like doing an integral. It's, it's like doing an integral. When you do an integral, you get some result and you evaluate it U1 and U2. Well, the, the thing you get is the Cornu spiral results and you just plug them in, you get your answer. Let's go ahead. D6. The unobstructed beam. Now, this is a very nice problem to do because what this problem does, it says we're going to look at an aperture and let it go so it's, it's, it's completely open. It can run to infinity. So that means when we do our integral with the u and the v, we're going to integrate over everything. So this is kind of a fun problem to do where you're saying uh, here, we're going to integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, e to the i pi, u squared over 2 du. Well, what is this? Well, this is c u from minus infinity to plus infinity plus I, consulting the table, minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is C infinity minus C negative infinity, just using the math, right? S standard stuff we do in math. And this is I, S infinity minus, minus infinity. If you take the C at infinity and subtract this one and that one you subtract, you're basically taking this one, subtracting the result there, so you're going to get, uh, you can think of it as like a little triangle, and this is a hypotenuse. So the value at negative infinity is here, the value at positive infinity is there, and that's basically what you're trying to do when you do this integral. You're simply evaluating at the negative infinity and plus infinity. So what is the length of this thing? Well, we, we know what that is. If you go from minus a half to plus a half in both directions, you're going to have a 1 and a 1, which means the length of this thing is square root of 2. And that's what I'm interested in, because I really am interested in the irradiance which is to take the length of the result of the integration. So that's, that's the simplest way to do it. I'm going to integrate from here to there, and then that's going to get me my, my length because I'm subtracting. Right? When we do the integrals, we're subtracting. And then what's the length? Square root of 2. So if you want to integrate over all of the space because there's no obstacle now, the opening, remember the opening is what we integrate over, and we're, the opening is everywhere now. So we're going to integrate e to the i pi u squared over 2 du. Integrate over the other dimension, e to the i pi v squared over 2 dv. And that, when I do this, you see this is going to get me here the c at infinity minus the c at minus infinity plus i, and this will be the same one, so I just need to write down one, s at infinity minus s at minus infinity. And remember, this is 0.5 on the chart, and this was here a negative 0.5 on the chart. This one here is 0.5, and this one's negative 0.5 on the chart. Just to refresh your memory, you pull this out. Notice that the infinity point is here, and that has coordinates 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Negative infinity is here, negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5. So we use that here, and this becomes 1. This becomes 1. So the EP integral is E naught 1 plus 
i, and there's another one here, one plus i. Now, so now if you want to do the EP, the magnitude squared, I like to do it like this this time, EP, EP star. And this is going to be E naught, one plus I, one plus I. This is still going to be an E naught, but then, but then when you do the star, you get one minus I, and one minus i, and now this is cool. When you take these two together, you're gonna get uh, one plus one. Because remember, if you have a plus b and a minus b, you get a squared minus b squared. So one squared minus i squared is gonna be one squared minus i squared is gonna be one minus a negative one, which is gonna be two. So that means for the EP, the irradiance is going to be proportional to this. It's going to be E naught squared, and there's going to be a 2 times a 2. So this will be 4 E naught squared. And the, the case of normalization now is I want this to be the amplitude of the unobstructed beam. So here's what I do. This is done a lot in quantum mechanics and probability theory where the probability of all cases have to be uh, one. So if I make A naught over two, my constant, so when I integrate from U1 to U2, this is my general, my general formula now, I pi U squared over two du, V1 to V2, E to the I pi V squared over two, if you start with this, then when, in other words, we're saying the E naught is really an A naught over two, because if you do that, then when you get the E naught squared, you get A naught squared over four, and that four will cancel this four, and this one will have the amplitude when you square it. This one's gonna be A naught squared, which is what I want. I want I want the unobstructed beam to have a, a reference. So I, this is the definition to make. It's called normalization. So this is then the master formula to do Fresnel diffraction. Now we can make slits and rectangular openings and then use this integral to work things out. Now what I would like to do here is set this up for a slit. I set this up for a slit, I'm going to integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity on the height for the slit. And then the slit will have a width. Okay, if I want to take here, this is going to be like, if you have, remember if you have the vec, remember if you have a complex number like this or a phaser, when you do the bars on there like that, you want the, the length of the phaser. So using Pythagorean theorem. So here, I'm going to do a naught over two, and uh, the A naught is considered to be a magnitude. So therefore, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna have the first integral here. And then I'm gonna do it to the second integral. Now, we worked out one of these integrals from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, if we do that, we did one of these, and we got a 1 plus i. So, the 1 plus i is going to give you then a square root of 2. So, that square root of 2 will modify the far left, and this would be my general formula if I have a slit. And I can pick now U or V, it doesn't matter. I'll go ahead and use, use U. Say I integrated over the V1. Uh, I integrated over the V1. I want to have the U. In other words, let's, let's, let's call this the U1 and say the V1 we integrated over. So just tick that over the here and leave this one alone. So this would be then E to the I pi U squared 
over two du. And this becomes my formula to work out the fraction, for now the fraction for like slits and things like that. V7, phaser properties. I'm gonna include a section in the book which I refer you to because when I apply this principle, like if I have a product of two phasers or two complex numbers, if I do this to find the magnitude of the phasers, the multiplied phasers, then I'm going to apply this to each one individually. Hopefully you've seen this before in some math class using complex numbers. If not, if you were sick that day, I've done it for you. In other words, here's the review. Just go through the few steps and see the proof that you can make this. And that's important because uh, we'll use it up in here. You know, when we have a product like this, and these are complex numbers, when we do this, uh, we can break this up into two and do them individually so that I can go ahead and put one there like that, you know, one there, do them separately. So that's something to, to just re do a refresh on. All right, here we have it. Leonard, Leonard Euler and Alfred Cornu. The Euler spiral, the Cornu spiral. And guess what? This spiral has nice mathematical properties because with Euler, it was actually before optics use. And that nice gentle curvature is used in engineering. In other words, the idea of having a road, a safe road curvature, so you can like merge in the highway and go around a loop, that they use Cornu spiral Euler's spiral mathematics. So this is this is again a, a, a connection with engineering that you're studying physics is training you with mathematical techniques that you could go into engineering because uh, uh, of what we did in optics. You see all these things that we're deriving the typical cloverleaf interchange. This is courtesy of Michigan Department of Transportation, released to the public domain. This is Wyoming, Michigan. Beautiful to just see that these curves curves are you know based on math mathematics uh, related to the Cornu spiral optics.